Hello, I'm Shane Brinkman Davis, and today I'm going to show you how to write a Turing complete language in 70 lines of Ruby. First, a little bit about the tools. This is going to work in Ruby 1.8 or Ruby 1.9, so if you have Ruby set up in your system, you're good to go. You will need to install a gem, the Babel Bridge gem, so you just say gem install Babel Bridge, and you should be good to go. A little bit about Turing completeness. Turing completeness is an important concept in computational theory, um, which basically says that if a machine or a programming language is Turing complete, then it can basically do anything that any other machine can do. It specifically, given enough time and enough memory, any Turing complete machine can do anything any other Turing complete machine can do. And currently, we know of no machines that are more powerful than Turing complete, with the possible exception of quantum, but that's a separate issue. So, if we can write a Turing complete programming language, then we're writing a programming language that can do anything any other programming language can do. So, this is pretty significant. So, here are what the basic requirements. Ultimately, in order to prove it's Turing complete, we should be able to simulate a Turing machine in our language, which the language we're writing today will be able to do that. We're not going to go into it, though. We're just going to heap the, the basic requirements, which are the basic math operators, um, conditionals, while loops, and the ability to have a potentially infinite memory. Of course, all actual memories are finite, but it could be an arbitrarily large memory, and that meets the requirements of a Turing machine for Turing completeness. So here's the plan. We are going to crank through, and we're going to start by building a calculator, and then we're going to add if statements and memory and the while loop, and then we'll have it. So with that, let's jump over and look at some code. So this initial code already has a little typo. We're going to require the Babel Bridge gem. And if you're in Ruby 1.8, you might have to require Ruby gems first. And then Babel Bridge, the way you create a new parser is you create a new class and you inherit from the Babel Bridge parser. And then you'll notice on this last line, I am using the Babel Bridge shell and should giving it a new instance of our parser. We'll see how that works in a little bit. It just gives us a really easy framework for testing. So inside the class, we start filling in our rules for what we want to parse. And we're going to start with something nice and simple. We're going to start with the rules for an integer. So all I did is I just type in rule, which is a method that gets invoked that starts defining things for us automatically. The name of the rule is the symbol int. And then after that, it is the in order list of things we want to match to match that rule. And I just put in a simple regex that accepts positive and negative integers. So now we pop over to the shell and we run the demo and here's our shell. And if I type in a number, It fails, and the reason why it failed is if I go back over here, I did not save. Now if I type in the number, you can see the results. So it spits out the parse tree, and the parse tree is an int node, which is int node one is actually a class that was created for us automatically by the rule definition, the rule method, and given the name that we provided it, which is int. And so it's an int node, and below the int node is the actual string that it matched, which is 23. If we type in something other than 23, we'll get a parsing error. And you can see that it shows where in the source the error occurred. And it also shows you an explanation of what you could have, what characters it was expecting next. In this case, it was expecting the characters to make a part integer. So now we can type in integers happily. Next, let's go ahead and see about matching. The addition of two integers. So I just define a new rule here called add, and it is going to match an integer followed by the symbol plus followed by another integer. Let's give that a quick whirl. Just stop and restart. I will make sure I save this time. And 
So if I say 23 plus 45, it says error. Did I indeed math save? There it goes. Thought I saved. Now you can see the parse tree matches the add node, which then has an int node in the string 23, then the string plus, then another int node and string 45. So this, that's all well and good. Um, let's make a couple notes here. If I try to type in just a number now, it's not going to work because our rule explicitly says that it only matches an int followed by a plus followed by an int. And also note that if I try to do 45 plus 45 plus 45, it's also going to complain because it's only expecting one addition. We can't chain a bunch of additions together. So let's go ahead and make this rule recursive. What we're going to do is we're going to allow you to have any number of adds, including no, no adds, just one integer. And that's how we do it. So what this rule now matches is it matches an int followed by a plus followed by another add. An add could also be, alternatively, as I've specified two versions of the rule here, just an integer. So it's going to match an integer and a plus and then more adds or just an integer. And as you'll see, let's double check that I'm saving. Restart it. 1 plus 2 works. Just the number 1 works. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 works. And you can see it creates this nested tree. And at each stage we have an add node and beneath it's an int node and another add node. Beneath that's another int node, another add node, etc. Let's go and now we're parsing, but it's going to be a lot more interesting if we actually do something with the results rather than just show the parse tree. We go over here, and with any node, with any rule definition, we can add a block. And inside this block, this will get executed inside the body of the class for the parse tree node. So what we want to do is we want to actually start defining some methods on those parse tree nodes. The shell that we are using specifically checks to see if the method evaluate is available. If it's not available, it's going to show us the parse tree, which is what we've been doing. But if it is available, it's going to call evaluate and then put out the results. So on the integer, I am going to convert the parse tree node to a string, which just returns the actual characters that were matched. And I'm going to convert it to an integer because we're just doing integers. So that'll evaluate to an integer. Let's give it a quick try. I type in one, two, three, and it gives me back one, two, three. Now, obviously, let's make this more interesting and define evaluate on the add node. And here is a little more magic going on. I'm typing int without the colon. And what that does is the magic of Babel Bridge says, well, you only have one subnode that you've named int. That is the rule int. So it's going to create a method automatically which returns the value, the parsed actual node for that subnode. And the method's name is going to be int, the name of that subnode's pattern. I'm going to call evaluate on that subnode. And then I'm going to add that to the evaluation of the add subnode. Evaluate. Now let's give that a quick try. Restart 1 to 3 plus 3 to 1. And now we can do additions. And it's actually computing a result, so pretty cool. So now, in order to flush out our calculator, let's go ahead and accept some more operators, more than just plus. So I just put in the regex that accepts the four basic operators. And instead of saying add, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to say send. And I want to send whatever the operator that we matched here is. And But there's no name for this. We've got a name int for this purse part, no name for this, and a name for add. If you don't have a name for something in Babel Bridge, you can just do it by the matches. So matches is an array of all the, all the results, zero based. So sub zero would be the int, and sub one is going to be our operator. And I'm just going to say, convert it to a string and then convert it to a symbol. Since that's what send expects. And then the second parameter is going to be whatever add evaluates to. So we save that, go back over here, stop and restart. And now I can say, Three times four, three times four plus five, three plus four times five. And you will immediately notice that we have a strange precedence rule going on here. Um, we have no operator precedence. We are operating and evaluating from left to right. So in this case, we do three times four. 4 plus 5 is 9, and then 9 times 3 is 27. The uh, way we define the rule is always going to be right associative. It's going to evaluate whatever the right-hand node is first, and then the combine that and build up to the left. So all of our tree is right-heavy on the branches. So any computation we do is going to be right associative. So that's absolutely right. So it's going to do 4 plus 5 first, which is 9, and then times 3 is 27, which is not at all what we want. So operator precedence. Here is where I'm going to have a little bit of magic, which is built into Babel Bridge. Whenever you're doing parsing with some type of parser generator like this one, you often have to specify precedence fairly manually with a bunch of rules, and it gets very tedious. So in Babel Bridge, I have added a handy facility for doing the specific operation of infix binary operators. So I'm going to just replace this code with this awesome little rule that Babel Bridge provides. Usually with Babel Bridge, you are just defining a bunch of rules with names that match a an in-order list of patterns. But in this case, I defined a special way to make a rule, which is the binary operators rule. You still give it a name. This is an arbitrary name. I'm now calling it statement rather than add because it's doing more than just adding. And then the two inputs are first the pattern for the operands. So in this case, we're just doing, still doing integers. And then a special pattern for operators. This operator list this is the slightly fancier version. We will come right back to it. But if I remove these brackets, it's just an array, a list of patterns, which can be strings, regexes, or symbols. Um, symbols and strings match exactly. Regexes match with what they match. And it is set in the order of precedence from left to right. And so in this case, all the divisions will happen first, and then all the multiplications, additions, and subtractions. That's not exactly what we want mathematically. What we want is a slightly more complicated version, which you can group a whole bunch of operators together, and they will have the same precedence, and then they'll be evaluated from left to right. So in this case, if there's a series of divide and times, they'll be evaluated, evaluated from left to right, and those will all happen first, and then any series remaining of pluses and minuses will be evaluated from left to right. Babel Bridge also supports, you can specify specific operators that you want to associate from right to left as well. A good example of that is the power operator, where two to the three to the four, you want to operate and do three to the four first, and then raise two to that result. So that's right associative. But we're not going to deal with that. We don't need that for our today's example. So we've added this in. The evaluation rule is fairly simple and sim very similar to what we had before. You will notice that I'm using the words left and right now. This Babel Bridge operators rule defines two methods on our parse tree nodes, our statement parse tree nodes. And those methods are left and right, three methods actually, and operator. Um, left will return whatever operand is on the left. 
this uh, generates this generates a binary tree effectively. And so left is the left hand side, right is the right hand side. Operator is in the middle, and so the operator will return us actually it'll return us the symbol that it, of what it matched, which is handy because then we can plug that right into the send. So we evaluate the left and send that to the operator, and then we evaluate the right, and that will do the computation. Let's go give it a try. This is fun. All right, we stop, we restart, and we say two plus four times five. Uh, four times five is 20 plus three, looks good. Now if we do it the other direction, five times four plus three, we should also get 23. So we have the correct associativity and the, and the correct uh, precedence. So that's a little bit of magic that allows us to express a basic four function calculator really succinctly. Now we're going to do just a little bit more to round out the calculator. It's often handy to be able to override the precedence rules. So parentheses. So I'm just adding a simple rule. I'm going to start calling these things operands instead of ints because they aren't just ints. So I just renamed our rules. Now we've got, we're searching for a bunch of operands separated by operators. And an operand can either be an open parenthesis matched by some statement, which is this rule up here, and then a closed parenthesis, or it can be just an integer. So with that little change, now we have arbitrary nesting of parentheses. It's a little magical how this works in that you can have, if you have two open parentheses, it's going to match this rule twice, and in order to successfully match this rule, it has to match two closed parentheses to complete. So let's go give that a quick whirl. So I didn't save it again. There we go. One plus two times three, so that's three times three, very nice. You can do the grouping otherwise, which is actually what the precedence gives us, it works out. We can put that on. If we have a mismatched number of parentheses, it's going to go in and it's gonna say, well, here's where I couldn't match any further, and it's saying, well, I could match further if you just give me a closed parenthesis, or if you continued on by adding some more operators. Well, let's add another operator, plus 10, and it's gonna still complain. Well, if you gave me a parenthesis, I could finish, otherwise I could just add some more operators. Well, let's close it with a parenthesis, and then it's happy and it does the computation. All right, so basically that is our four function calculator. We can do a lot of interesting stuff now from just a simple mathematical standpoint. One thing, I'd like to point out at this point, as I've been glossing over, is that that looks great, but if I put a space here, it's going to puke. It's going to say, I don't know what's going on here. In this case, it successfully matched the integer, but then it couldn't actually successfully match the plus rule because there's this space in there that it doesn't know how to deal with. With parsing expression grammars, you actually deal with the entire parse string one character at a time exactly as is. So if we want to deal with spaces, we have to figure out how to deal with spaces. Thankfully, I have added another little bit of simple magic to Babel Bridge to make it simple, make it easy in this case. Um, ignore white space. So if you run this method on your class, then it will ignore white space. And specifically how it does that is that every time it matches a literal, which is either a regex or a string, it'll then after that, match all white space it can, and then essentially ignore it. And most of the time, that's what you want if you're doing a language that is entirely white space agnostic. If you're doing something like Ruby that's a little bit white, cares a little bit white space about white space, or even something fancier like Python that is white space has a lot of meaning, you'll have to do different parsing patterns. But this gets us to first base very nicely today. So I can do, put some spaces in the middle of my computation, and it's perfectly happy. So now if we go look back at our plan, we have definitely successfully built a calculator. So now we want to add if statements. So first, I am going to just paste in the rule for if statements. It is also a statement, so note now that we have two rules for statement. We've got this rule for statement here, 
and then we have the binary operator, the binary operator's rule for statement. So there's two alternative forms of the statement. And now here's what the statement is doing. So first of all, it's going to match the string if, followed by a, a statement, followed by then, followed by another statement, and then there's this else clause. With the question mark at the end of it, that signals to Babel Bridge that you want to optionally match that rule. The rule is right here, and so it'll match, match an else and another statement, or it'll just match the end. So it's an optional else clause. Now let's just go through how the evaluation works. I'm again using the matches pattern that we saw earlier. So I am taking the second match, which is that statement, and evaluating it. If that's true, then I am going to do the next statement, match sub 3, which is the fourth, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and evaluate that. Else, we're going to evaluate the else clause if it exists. So if the else clause, if there are no parse tree nodes down the else clause, if it was not matched, this will return nil, and in Ruby that's false, and therefore it'll evaluate. It will not run it, otherwise it will. So this is a good time to stop for a second and think about what we mean by true and false. Now, basically, we can make choices. We're designing our own language. We can do whatever we want. I want to keep things as simple as possible. So my decision for this language was we are going to deal with integers, positive and negative, and nil. Nil is false, everything else is true. So that's pretty close to Ruby, and it gets a lot of what Ruby's defaults are are going to work well for this. So like in this case, if this evaluates to false, that the else clause is nil, then if this is going to return nil. So if this else clause is blank, and if the, fault, if the test failed, it's going to return nil. That makes us perfectly happy. In order to make if statements useful, we would also like to have some comparators. So let's go ahead and add in some comparators. Just copying and pasting this over. This is a list of the five standard comparators. I am putting them at a lower precedence than all the other operators. So divide, times, plus, and minus will all get processed first. And then we will go through the comparators. Now we've come down to evaluation. It's true we can just send a less than to two numbers and Ruby will process it correctly, but Ruby is going to return a true or a false value, literally a true or a false value, which is Ruby has classes for true and false, which is not what we want because we have a limited concept of what true is in our language. So I am going to just do a little bit more manual setup here. In fact, I'm just going to copy and paste this whole thing over and explain it. This is exactly the same line as before, but if it is a comparison operator, we are also going to do the same thing. However, we are going to test it, and if it is true, we'll return 1, otherwise return nil. And obviously this is duplicated code. This is the first time I noticed that, so let's go ahead and just do that to say the result equals that, and so if the the result is true, return one else nil for comparators, otherwise just return the result. Very nice. I think I just added one line of code to my 70 lines of code. But it's cleaner and I like it better. All right, so now we're looking pretty good on the plan. We have if statements. Let's try them out. First of all, let's see if our comparators do what we think they should do. 1 less than 2, that's true, so it returns a 1. 1 less than 0 is false, so it returns nil. That's great. And it's very handy. Ruby most of the time gets this right. So I've only had to do a few special cases in order to go around Ruby's, where Ruby does something different from what we want. So if I say if 1 less than 2, then 3, end. You notice I've got verbose keywords. I've got a keyword separating every single part. And that's because we're ignoring white space, unlike in Ruby, where Ruby takes some white space cues so it can avoid those extra keywords. Here we have to be a little bit more explicit. So that's true, one less than two is three. If one is less than zero, then it would do an else clause, but there is no else clause, so that's nil. If we add an else clause, then it returns a four. Awesome. All right, the next step is to add a store. 
which was right here, adding some memory. So there's a lot of different ways we can do this, but what I think makes the most sense for this example is to do this. We are going to add this method store on our parser. So this is an instance method, notice, and so every instance of our parser is gonna have its own unique store. Seems fairly reasonable. And all this is is the store is gonna start with an empty array. Now we wanna access that store. So I am going to, let me just paste in this bit first and explain it and then we'll fill in the rest. So this is the way I'm going to define the write statement. So writing to the store is you just do an open bracket, you do some computation, any computation you want, and that's gonna return a number and a close bracket, equals, and then whatever number you want, that's the value you're gonna store. Now we'll just go ahead and add in the evaluation. So when you evaluate, we're going to First, do parser here. Uh, every node in the parse tree has a method called parser, which returns the current parser it was parsed with. So parser.store accesses the store for that parser. We will take the, ah, here's a little bit of additional magic. We've got more than one term, which is statement. And if you have more than one term with the same name, Bridge creates an array of the results, and so, in this case, I'm accessing the first results of the first statement and evaluating it, which will give us the index into the store where we're going to store it. And then we're going to evaluate the second statement, which is statements of one. I could, again, use the matches that we used up here. But in this case, I'd have to say match 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And that's fine, but it's a little less resilient if you want to change around the way your strings look like, which, like, maybe I wanted to do this. It means I couldn't have white space between those two, but that'd be otherwise perfectly reasonable but then it would break our matches. So I prefer to use the statement method, it's a little more resilient. So we're gonna store a number into our big store here. Again, Ruby does a very nice set of things with the array class that elements in the store that aren't defined are nil. If we try to store some random big number, Ruby will automatically resize the array to be that big and populate everything else with nils. So that works very nicely with our language because nil is allowed in our language. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy and paste the whole read rule here. And it's pretty straightforward. It's the same basic syntax, but then you, don't, you just don't put an equals after it. And then we access the store and we take the value from the statement and that pulls out the value and returns the results. So now we have a memory store. Let's give it a whirl. This looks a little bit strange compared to other languages because we don't all we have is just this flat memory store. So it's like accessing raw memory in a certain sense. So if I say sub zero, it's going to give me nil. If I said sub zero equals one, two, three, and then I access it again, it's still there. And I can access sub 100 and it's perfectly happy. And I can assign that a number and I can assign it what's in zero, for example. And I can get evaluated if it works. And other nice things work too, like I can do a chained assignment works great. You can put assignments in the middle of things if 1 equals 2, 3, 4, which is going to be true by default because it's not nil, then 1 times 2. And there it goes. All that works with the way we set up our parser here. Let me just reiterate a little bit about how this magic is working. Notice that we have four different rules for operands. So a statement can be an operand, and the binary operators rule, keep in mind, can happily match no operators, just one operand and be happy. And the operand options are an assignment statement, a read statement, a parentheses, and then any other statement inside that, or a number. And it can do this recursively, it can do it as many times as it needs to, and it gives us a pretty good result. So there's one thing I didn't add on our little to-do list here, but it is just a nicety that we probably would like to have at this point. Right now, our code 
for an if statement only allows you to have one statement inside the then block or inside the else clause. And that can get pretty limiting. So what I'd like to do is I would like to allow us to be able to type in multiple statements. So here is the rule for doing multiple statements. So for matching, just this first line here, I'm using a little bit more Babel Bridge magic. This many keyword says match as many of these as you want optionally, and I have provided the optional delimiter. So as many statements as you want delimited by semicolons. So it's pretty traditional C-ish syntax. Um, delimited means in between, and so I added this ability to optionally match a trailing semicolon. So the last statement in a list doesn't have to have a semicolon. A little bit unc like but since you don't have to, why bother? Um, actually, my question, again, I should say, is a Babel Bridge keyword. And since I'm just putting a literal, I have, this is the best way to do it. I'm saying question conditionally match the semicolon. Now, for evaluating statements, I want to do the same thing that Ruby does, which is pretty straightforward. I want to return the value of the very last statement, and I want to evaluate each statement in order. So that's what this does. It evaluates each statement in order, and it keeps remembering the last statement's return value, and then returns the last return value it got. And now, all we have to do is come down here and change this from statement to statements, and this one from statement to statements, and we're good. Now our if and else clause can match as many statements as they want, and the entire program, since this is now the first rule listed, can now match as many statements as it wants. In case I didn't say that clearly earlier, the Baylor Bridge parser looks at the very first rule you define, and that's where it starts doing its matching. I'm not going to demo that right now. We'll get right back around to it as we wrap this up. So now we're going to do the last bit. The last bit is adding a loop, the while clause, the while statement. I'm going to go and put it right next to the if. And given the if, it's pretty straightforward to see how the while is going to work. It's a while followed by a statement, followed by do, followed by one or more statements inside the while loop, and then an end. We already have this good definition of true and false, which happens to be compatible with Ruby's definition of true and false. So we come down here and we just use a Ruby's while statement. While the statement evaluates to true, notice that we have a statement and we have statements, plural. Then we do statements that evaluate. So every time the statement is true, then we evaluate the statements. Ruby will return whatever the result of this is, and then it turns out the, the evaluate. So we will return from the while loop. Actually, that's not true. Ruby doesn't do what I think is reasonable here. Ruby actually will return um, false, I believe, from a while loop. So nil, hopefully. So it's the dark constraints. Um, so that's all good. We could actually make, we could arbitrarily decide how we want to make this work. I'm going to leave it alone at the moment. So now we've added a while loop. And in fact, that does now make this a Turing complete language. Let's go play around with it a little bit. So um, let's do, I'm going to say that equals 10. I'm going to say while that is greater than 0, do 0 equals 0 minus 1, end. And that worked great. Ruby returned a nil. But that's not too terribly interesting because we didn't actually see any results. So let's do something a little bit more interesting. I'm going to set another memory location to 1. And every time we decrement this guy, I am also going to multiply this guy by 2. Oh, nothing seemed to have happened. Well, it did modify the memory. We just didn't output the results because it only outputs the very last thing. So let's go ahead and output the results. Ah, oh, the results is 1,024. So we just took the value 1 and doubled it 10 times to get 1,024. And in fact, we can double it 100 times and get a huge number. Nice that Ruby automatically handles large ints for us built in, ready to rock and roll. So that's pretty much it. I'm going to go ahead and pull out a quick little uh, more fun example here. What I just pasted in here actually computes the Fibonacci sequence. So I'll just go through it really quickly. Our language is a little ugly, mind you, but it would not take too many additional lines of Babel Bridge to make it look even nicer. 
Um, this first bit sets the what index into the sequence that we want. So this is going to return us the fifth uh, Fibonacci number. This is what the current number we're on. It happens to work well to start out at two because the first two are the same. One and two are both one. And then we set the last two Fibonacci values to one. And then we iterate. We say while the one that we want, which is five, which is in stored sub zero, is greater than the one that we're at, which is currently starts out at two, then we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna create a temporary variable, which is the sum of the last two Fibonacci numbers. We're going to move the last one over to two ago, and then we're going to set the last one to the one we just computed and we're going to increment where we're at. And when we're done, we're going to spit out the value of the last Fibonacci we just did. So if I do that, it's 5. Well, it turns out 5 in Fibonacci is 5. But if I go to 6, you can see it's 8, which is correct. And in fact, a useful Fibonacci one to test is 12 happens to be the same as its square, which is 144. So there we are, we're computing Fibonacci's with our programming language. Pretty awesome. And in fact, we can get even fancier. Um, there is an example in the Babel Ridge. I'm not sure it's in the Babel Ridge distribution. Let me just put it at the end of this video for you. Let me just slide this over here. And you will see right here. I'm not going to go into all the details right here, but this actually will simulate a Turing machine fully and completely. And I fully tested this admittedly, so I can't guarantee you that I've got it exactly implemented correctly. But basically, this should emulate a Turing machine, and since it can emulate a Turing machine, that would literally prove that our machine is Turing complete. So, let's just wrap this up. First of all, how many lines of code do we have? 71 lines of code. That's uh, one additional line that I simplified, added a little bit to it. So, pretty awesome. I think it's pretty awesome. We built the Turing Complete programming language and we did it in not a lot of time. I have to look at what the time ends up being, but it's like 40, 50 minutes. And we we'll use Babel Bridge. And Babel Bridge, I wrote it, so it's my baby. I, I get the right to really love it. But I think that it makes it super easy to parse things. And I like that it uses a fully Ruby syntax that's clean and simple and elegant. It provides a shell, which makes it really easy for you to test what you're parsing test out your parser and interact with it and try a couple things out and get really clear feedback um, from the parse tree output, which is I've been tuning it quite a bit to give you the most concise, useful parse tree output. And I spent a lot of time on those human readable parse failures. Let's just go take one more quick look at those because I've spent a lot of time on them and I'm pretty proud of them. Um, so if I say one plus, we come down here and there's a lot of things going on here. It says where we parsed to successfully the path down the parse tree to where we managed to get. And then it says, these are the bits that we matched, which is pretty useful. We, I mean, the, the bit that we need to in order to continue. And so there's three different kinds of terminals that are accepted at this point that could allow the parsing to continue. And only those three. A letter wouldn't work. Um, so an open bracket, an open curly, or an integer would allow us to continue parsing at this point. So I do an open parenthesis, two plus four, bam, it works. So that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Again, this is how to write it in 71 lines of code using Babel Bridge, Shane Brigman Davis. Uh, I hope you enjoy. I hope you give it a whirl. Um, give me some feedback on my blog. I'll put a, hopefully there'll be a link to it from the YouTube here. And uh, let me know if you need any other features and if you, I'd like to see what you do with Babel Bridge.